uh, we are live. Uh, we're live streaming with Leon over here to the rest of the world. So you are on camera if you're presenting. Uh, I'm just going to let Stephen introduce the format of Teach Meets if you've not been to one before. Uh, this is SL Teach Meets, so do remember the hashtag. There is a live stream here going across uh, the internet. So if you are tweeting, then please include the hashtag. Uh, that's for everyone outside the room to tune in and see what we're doing. Uh, this is the second SL Teach Meet ever. Uh, so we're really excited that this is uh, evolving as a strategic version of Teach Meet. I'm going to hand over to Stephen just to tell you how it works. For those who haven't been to a Teach Me before, imagine a day-long course, uh, and then get rid of that idea, uh, because often a day-long course, you arrive at 10.30, and then you hope the pastry's by 11, it's finished by 3.30, everyone's wondering about what time to get their train. Uh, squeeze that into two hours, where you'll get up to 20 talks on a variety of topics, uh, and so there's the opportunity for you to get at least five good ideas. And I promise you, if you don't get five ideas, we'll give you your money back. And we have used that joke before. Um, so uh, it's, it's much better than that because you're actually hearing people from a short space. So the ideas you should be seeing tonight are from existing or aspiring SLTs that they've used either yesterday or today that you can take back to your schools tomorrow. Um, there's no hard sell, there's no pitch. Uh, we've got people who are paying, and they're paying for this venue. We've got quite a few creators of Colin and Barney uh, School Hall for you here this evening. Um, and uh, no one has tried to sell anything. That away, you actually get the, the heart of what people are trying to do, which is sharing good practice. You're here on a lovely sunny Monday evening of your own volition uh, to try and develop your own uh, practice, and that's fantastic. So, all credit to you uh, for doing that straight away. We've got a range of speakers on a range of subjects, and hopefully, we'll get a lot out of this. We've changed the format of the teach meet slightly in that we create a running order. So, there'll be a 60 minute talk, and then a three minute talk, and then a 60 minute talk, and then a Uh, with a red balloon on it. So, can you delve out that red balloon now, please? At the last Teach Me I went to, there were 200 of us making balloon animals. There's not many animals you can make with a round balloon, to be honest. Um, but it does have the word eagle on it. So, let's, let's blow these up to start off with. Let's all have a bit of exercise. <gasps> Okay, we have 20 speakers this evening who are going to be sharing things that they've done in their schools and their classrooms. And that's incredibly brave of them to do because they're, they're holding it out and saying, this has worked for me. Uh, it takes a lot of ego 
to uh, start an initiative because there are going to be people that criticise it. And hopefully we're in an environment where people will be supportive of that. So let's make this fall a little bit messy by letting go of the balloons. <laughs> and one of them has burst already. So they can blame the DT teachers for that, two of them. There's an angry history teacher in the background. Okay. Uh, gents, loosen your ties. Ladies, loosen your shoes. Uh, we're here to relax, have fun, and at the same time, learn great stuff. We're going to start off with a fantastic head teacher, one of these people who sickeningly comes up with really clever ideas all the time. Uh, probably a nightmare to work for, but let's find out what he's got to say. <laughs> no pressure, Tom. Head teacher Guru. Okay. Are you going to give me a, a, a 30 second warning or something? Okay, well, my talk is called um, Rainforest Thinking, and I have written a blog about this, which is about actually moving from plantation thinking to rainforest thinking. And for me, this is uh, quite abstract, but actually has practical implications when you get into running a school. It's quite seductive on the surface, a plantation. It looks ordered, and things are generally growing and, and, and succeeding. But if you look closely, everything is the same. Everything is uniform. And I think in school leadership, we have this tendency to want everything to be neat and tidy and ordered, and we impose order where, actually, by doing that, we're stifling a number of things. We're stifling individuality, creativity, and we're cutting off options, possibilities of things that we aren't able to see. And that affects things like teacher uh, performance. It affects teaching in the classroom professional development, all sorts of initiatives. And I'm suggesting that sometimes what we need to do is allow ourselves to break away from that need for order and embrace a more uh, free view of how things should be and embrace what I call rainforest thinking. And when you sort of switch from the plantation to the rainforest, you know, there are a few things straight away. It's, it's a lot more... Um, scary on one level, if you look at the picture on the right, you know, it's quite, you know, alarming in a way. You go in and think, gosh, well, we don't know what we're going to get. But actually what you find is that if you let things go, if you, if you let the, the controls um, off, you find all sorts of different things emerge that you never thought you were, you'd see before. And I actually first came up with this analogy when I went to the school that I work in now, which... I, where I saw forms of teaching and learning that I'd never seen before. And I felt that where I was working before, I was thinking in this form. You know, there, were, there was a standard set of expectations for what lessons would be. There was a generic template for an outstanding lesson. CPD tended to be all of the staff doing all of the things the same. We would do assessment for learning training for the whole staff behavior management training for the whole staff. And there was a sense of, yeah, we've done it, we've ticked the box, we've, we're, we're covering all our bases. But then I've gone to my new school, and for example, all the teachers have different formats of computer. Um, some don't like interactive whiteboards, some don't have any. Some have iPads, some don't. Some have a Mac, some have PCs. Um, CPD, we find, is much better if we just say, these things are on, go to it if you want to. And workshops, you form groups with the people you want to work with and see what happens. And increasingly, we're, we're moving down this direction. And it's like this. We've even started saying middle leaders meetings, um, pair up with the people you want to work with and do stuff and see what happens, rather than having horrible meetings with 30 people in a room tensely trying to negotiate something. And this type of thing is very liberating. So we're finding projects are emerging, initiatives are taking root, which wouldn't have happened if we were imposing something on everybody. And it's happening in the classroom increasingly. If you say to people, do what you want, you'll find people have to become a bit more self-sufficient, a bit more creative. Of course, though, then there's a danger that things are going to slip through. If you apply this thinking to students, there's a, a safety around the plantation. You know, we're making sure that people are all getting the basic ingredients, and that feels good. But actually, what you get is a very standardized set of learning outcomes, and that's limiting. In the rainforest, 
Oh, hang on, what's happened? Hello, hello, hello. I can't see it. I have lost control. Maybe I'll just press down on this. No? Anyway. In the rainforest view of learning, you find students are doing different things in different lessons, and actually the culture is about being a much more creative. We're moving now this term to develop a new form of lesson observation where it's individualized to every department. So we're trying to define what we think outstanding learning is in each department separately and encouraging heads of department to go their own way so that we don't have a generic lesson observation format. It's just appropriate to the areas and the heads of department can decide how that, well, they want that to look. And if they think it's outstanding, then it is. And that type of thinking is liberating for them and creates a culture of people feeling trusted, more creative, and of course there are pitfalls. You've, you've got to make sure that the quality is always good and you need to show it. But what does quality look like? It can be all sorts of things. So the rainforest is about lots of different ways of doing things, not having a standard view. And as long as it's fantastic, you don't really mind which version it is you get. Thank you. Megan, you're next, but before Megan speaks for three minutes, uh, Ross yeah, is just uh, going to go through the program. Well done, Tommy, actually five minutes. Uh, okay, uh, we have a live program, but uh, it's obviously based. So if you want to access that, it is the web address is bit.ly forward slash SL teach me as it's written uh, with the two on the end. So that's bit.ly forward slash SL teach me two. You get a program with all the speakers and all the biographies. Uh, but I just want to introduce to our sponsors prizes for the night. So this wouldn't be possible without Russell and his team from Optimus Ed, who have allowed us to uh, hook onto the back of the Education Law Conference today. So thank you, Russell. Fabulous venue. Uh, thanks for all your help. Uh, but also we have some prizes that we're going to give away through th the night. Uh, first prize from Teaching Leaders. So I'll give you some more information later. Uh, New Media Core. Uh, and show my homework. So those are our people, uh, companies providing some prezzies. And Anna? MediaCore, not MediaCore. Apologies. Okay. Uh, so we'll tweet all those out and we'll introduce prizes as we go through the night. So it's Megan's turn. Let me put my glasses on first before you start the timing. Okay, I'm ready. Um, hello, everyone. This is I'm a fraud. Um, and I am a bit odd. I used to be a primary school teacher, I used to be a deputy head, I'm now working in higher education, and I'm really interested in how we develop. And what I'd like you to take away from this isn't something you can use tomorrow, but it's something that you can perhaps think about tomorrow that might take you forward. So that's the aim of my three minutes. Anyone out there in the front of me got a master's degree? Excellent, how's that? Anyone got a doctoral degree? Oh well, you can come and see me later, I'll sign you up. So. <laughs> I was wondering why, we're, why we as Brits are so embarrassed sometimes about our qualifications. We know in Finland that most teachers have master's degrees, and I'd like to give you three reasons why I think, although you're really busy and you're doing lots of things, you should consider if you haven't got a master's, you should sign up for one. If you haven't got a doctorate, you should sign up for one. So my three reasons are, one, you can become a learner again. Because I do think, talking to some of my head teachers who are on the course at Cambridge with me, becoming a learner again really does make you realise that there are some things that are really difficult to learn. Referencing, for example, in higher education. You can discuss viewpoints with other people and you can really think about what works in your situation, but, um, but also to look at research about different situations and what works. So becoming a learner again is very important. Secondly, I think you should think about doing a master's degree or a doctoral degree because, like the L'Oreal commercial, you are worth it. Um, I do think that um, finding time for yourself as a school leader is really, really difficult. And as a little treat to yourself, doing an extra postgraduate degree allows you some thinking time. It allows you to think about things that you're doing at school. And I know over the many years since I've been in higher education, some of my master's students have got projects that are really relevant to the day-to-day -day ma management of their school and have found they found them really useful. So that's another thing that you can do on a master's degree. If you can make it relevant to your senior leadership practice, then it's much, much better for you to do, and you will find time for it. Um, the third reason I think you should consider perhaps doing a postgraduate um, degree is, dare I say it, I know it's just leave egos behind, self-advancement. 
I'm chair of government with an outstanding school. I had to say that we were officers last week, so I had to put that in. Um, and I do think that's something that we do look for in schools. People who are willing to learn and improve themselves, it is a very interesting thing to put on your CV. And I would say that that's one reason why you might want to do a master's degree. So what can you, what can you do? Do it for yourself, do it for your school, and do it for the future. And at the end of it, you'll still be confused, but at a much higher level. Thank you. Just to clarify, it's Media Core, not New Media Core. Uh, Media Core are offering 12 month subscription uh, to their service, which at the moment is a mystery, but I'm sure they'll tell us about it. But more importantly, they're offering a bottle of champagne. <laughs> yeah, don't get that at an ordinary CPD event, do you? So if you could uh, demonstrate your need for this champagne, why you deserve this champagne in a tweet, uh, mention Media Core, not New Media Core, and uh, SL Teach Meet, the best reason for needing that champagne, and it's needing, not wanting, needing that champagne, uh, perhaps a med medical emergency, uh, the best tweet will win that. Uh, next up is Bill. So Bill is going to, he is from SSAT, and what are you going to talk about today, Bill? Um, policy development for lower education. Whoa! Hold on to your hands, folks. <laughs> this may be one of those calls for champagne. <laughs> Hello everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the things that have happened in the last few months and their implications for schools and how schools might think. There's an awful lot that's been happening and it may not be possible to do it all in, uh, in six minutes. I saw a picture on the internet recently of a cassette and a pencil and, someone, and, and the question underneath was, if you're old enough to know the connection between these two objects, you're probably old enough to wonder about the pace of change in education. It's not happening. Um, four big announcements on the 7th of February from the Secretary of State. One was about changing GCSEs, one was about changing A-levels and AS-levels, one was about the national curriculum, and one was about the accountability framework. And I'm going to say a little bit about each of those. First of all, key stage four. Uh, we had the issues surrounding the GCSE results for English last summer, and since then, uh, Ofqual has said a number of different things, one of which that was that we must be clear from the outset about what's happening. So it was interesting a couple of weeks ago when they proposed that we should change the English GCSE right in the middle of the course once the year 10s have almost completed their English, so we no longer have listening and speaking contributing to the final grade. It's going to make lots of English teachers very happy. Um, we moved away from the introduction of the EBCs, largely because, uh, well, a variety of reasons, but, but uh, the Secretary of State said that the one subject, one board idea was a bridge too far. So what we're going to have is reformed GCSEs. We will still have the English back as a measure appearing in the league tables. And um, we'll have more challenging, more rigorous, more difficult to pass GCSEs. And the content for the English back subjects should have appeared yesterday, but it will in fact be appearing in the middle of next month. We'll start teaching them in 2015, start assessing them in 2017. So the materials are due to be with us in about 12 months so that we can start preparing for that. They will not have tiering because to have a foundation and a higher paper is to impose a ceiling on attainment and that is demotivating. But we will have core papers with extension papers for the more able. <laughs> not quite sure what the difference is but I'm sure we'll find out soon. And we will have lots more extended writing, in particularly English and history, with fewer bite-sized questions. And we'll be concentrating on knowledge and content as opposed to competences and skills if there is indeed a spectrum with one end of, of, of a polar opposite to the other. Um, most people, I think, would say we need a bit of both, but there is very definitely a polarization of opinion about pedagogy at the moment. Key stage five, we're going to have uh, A-levels, which will be not linear, uh, sorry, which will not be modular and will have a terminal assessment at the end, of course. And we will have those new exams coming in in exactly the same time frame as the key stage four changes, just to keep everybody appropriately busy. And um, they will be, again, more challenging, more rigorous. And the AS will not be a stepping stone towards the A2. In other words, the AS won't be a, a part one of a two-part a-level qualification. It will be a standalone qualification. Originally, up until about 10 days ago, it was going to be of the same intellectual level as an A-level, but half the content. Now it's not. It's been changed very recently. It's going to be 
the intellectual level of an AS level, and it will be possible to complete an AS level in one year, and it will be possible to go on to do an A level, but your A level will test you at A level standard on the content of an AS. Glad you've got that. There's a level three vo vocational qualification. We're moving away from about 4,000 vocational qualifications that currently exist to a world where there would be more, more like 175, and the watchword is rigor. They've got to be, in order to achieve parity with the academic qualifications, rigorous and challenging. And there'll be two types of vocational qualification. There will be applied general, which are a bit like the applied A-levels, and there'll be occupational, which is clear what they are. The accountability framework, the consultation has now closed. There are a couple of things that have been said outside the uh, consultation exercise itself, but about accountability. We're going to have a new breed of school leader who will be substantially financially incentivized and will be called an exceptional leader. And the impetus will be to get head teachers to take responsibility for turning around performance in another school. We've got the data dashboard, which a lot of parents and governing bodies seem to like, but I think is perhaps slightly uh, a blunt instrument at the moment and needs a bit of contextualization and clarification. Don't forget that Ofsted find that if you put on a show, it is deeply irritating and you shouldn't do it. And nor should you enter students early unless you're absolutely certain that they're going to get the very best possible grade they can get. And if you didn't do it a bit later, they wouldn't get a better grade. So if you've got a condensed key stage three and you're entering students in year 10, you might want to review that practice. Um, the idea of the new accountability framework, the league tables, is to stop the focus on the CD borderline and to, uh, to make sure we focus on all subjects. So there won't be any more 5A to C with English and maths. There will be the percentage passing English and maths, and there will be a best eight qualification, uh, a best eight measure, which is a progress measure, how the students are doing in particular subjects. And there will be an ABAC, which will mean an AAB in three facilitating subjects, and there will be a tech back, and I'm going to stop there. It takes a particular skill to talk about such a dry subject in such a humorous way, so thank you, Bill. Um, it's now, uh, Miranda, your turn to speak for three minutes on special needs. Um, some of the tweets are coming in on champagne. Some of them are lots of misspellings and some slurred words. I think you've probably had enough champagne already for today. Um, keep those tweets coming in and please use the hashtag SLTeachMeet. I know it's long, but it is worthwhile. Uh, over to you, Miranda. Um, I'm not actually talking about special needs for a change. Okay, um, welcome. The reason, obviously, that it said that is that um, I originally come from the special needs background from the special schools. And um, I had recently, with a former colleague of mine, actually started a company so that we can actually pass our knowledge on into the mainstream system. And since we've been doing this, we've been learning an awful lot. It's quite interesting when you're in a school. Um, the world sort of goes on around you and you sort of get the, the world outside. It's sort of very different. It's, you know, we don't run schools as businesses in that way. And we found an awful lot out recently. So can I just ask please in this room, how many of you have actually ever phoned your school up? Just phone them up. You know? Did you get a really positive view? You know, was it sort of, hi, you know, you know, we're really friendly and, you know, and everything, you know, you want to come here? No, yeah, yeah, it's quite interesting actually you say that because I've, I've been phoning a lot of schools that I've had. Um, I don't have time for this, phone me back later. Um, hold on, you are the receptionist, aren't you? Um, and I'll be asking, can I just confirm that the name of your head teacher is? It's on the website. Well, the website says it's uh, Mr. Jones. Is Mr. Jones still your head teacher? I actually know. So there's a lot that sort of goes on that we sort of forget about. And part of the thing I sort of want to get to is to think about things, because your website actually tells you quite a lot about your school. And Ofsted actually look at your website for that information before they come in, apart from obviously, you know, your raised online and your last Ofsted and any other reports that you've had in between. So when you think about it, how easy is it to actually find the phone number on your website? You know, if you're a parent and you need to phone the school, how easy is it to find the email address? I mean, sometimes I can't even find the phone number, or I've got to go through so many tabs to even find it. 
And as for the email address, I actually sort of need a magnifying glass right at the very bottom. It is so small. And we seem to forget that websites, there's a lot about us, and who it's actually for. It's actually for the parents. It's, you know, we are turning to the parents for a really good school, and this is what we do, and everything else. I mean, at the moment, we're all being asked to actually put online our PPG, all our spends and the information. So it's another bit of food for thought. How are you actually putting it online? Who is it actually for? Is it for you, the governor, Ofsted? Or is it actually for the parents? Is it for the parents, the children you're actually spending it on? So just think about how you're actually putting it on. Is it very wordy? Is it very simple? Have you used lots of stats that parents might not understand? Think about your audience. So that's pretty much what I've just wanted to say today. It's just think a little bit more differently about how you view your school from the outside looking in. Fantastic. Thank you. One more thing, I'd be very grateful if somebody could lend me a pair of shoes with shoelaces on at the break time because um, I need to show Stephen a special way of doing shoelaces. I can do my shoes up, I'm just, just to clarify that. I can do that, just about. Thank you very much, Miranda. Next we have James Heal. James, are you here? Yep. Uh, James, first year as a head, is that right? Yes. Look, he's shaking, bless him. <laughs> okay, let's welcome James to the stage, please. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, is that up there? Yeah, anybody who follows John Tomsett knows that I've stolen that wholeheartedly off his blog. Uh, very, very good blog every week. Um, and it's just really about my journey, I guess, through the first sort of nine months uh, of headship. It's a bit like being a best man tonight. You couldn't wait to get it out of the way so I can sit back and relax and enjoy the rest of the presentations. So, um, moving forwards, I hope. Okay, so are you ever ready? Um, Everybody said to me, you know, get all your mistakes out of the way when you're a deputy, uh, make sure your home life is in perfect order before you think about becoming a head, do this, do that. And the truth of the matter is I don't think you're ever ready. Um, you know, I've got a three-year-old who managed to break her arm in two places on my first day at school, um, at my new school, um, a seven-year-old from a previous marriage. Uh, you know, my life is fairly chaotic outside of school, I think, but it doesn't stop you sort of going on to headship. I think really I was inspired by a lot of hero heads and I'm going to talk about those later on. Um, and really nothing prepares you for it. It's really just rocket fueled CPD every day and every week and learning on a very, very steep curve. Um, essentially, it's not a difficult job and I know that sounds like I'm going to be unpopular with certain heads in the room, but it's not a complicated job because essentially all you're doing is making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. But what it is is unbelievably complex and it's the intensity of it, I think, that's really surprised me. It's nothing I did as an assistant head or deputy head uh, prepared me for it. And the complexity and variety of decisions you make on a day-to-day -day basis. And I guess it's a bit like know what you don't know and make sure you ask for help from people that do know the answer. And that bit of blissful ignorance about not knowing what you don't know until it comes up and bites you on a Monday morning. Um, for me, there's a big difference about quick wins and culture change. I went on a lot of courses before I became a head, and I was told that actually don't do anything in the first 100 days. You know, don't literally, you know, don't put pen to paper, sit back and watch. But it actually, just about trusting your gut instinct is important. And there was a lot of quick wins I made early on, whether it would be about getting rid of school bells, uh, changing PMR, putting in movement time, whatever. All these things that I decided to do very quickly, not big things, but were quick wins and really laying down the law on uniform. And I know that's, uh, that people would decide whether they agree with that or not. But when you look at the culture change, that takes a lot longer, and you've got to be in it for the long game. Uh, and that can be frustrating at times. Uh, what really, uh, one of the things I've been thinking about is about these high leverage activities. What things can you do that have a massive impact, or at least are perceived to have a big impact, even if actually they don't require a great deal of effort? So I went over the summer and on holiday I sat on the beach and learned every member of staff's name before I started there in September by just looking at their photos, just so I could work, go in on that first day and as people contributed I could thank them by their name. Now it's a small thing but it makes a big difference. Uh, I interviewed all 160 staff for about uh, 10 minutes each um, 
I put presence uh, at the top of every SLT job description and worked out where we were going to be at every lesson changeover and every uh, break time and lunchtime, etc. Um, Remembrance Day, I got the whole school out into the playground um, to, uh, and had the last post played uh, on trumpet, etc. Not because I was feeling particularly patriotic, but I wanted to do something to prove to staff that we could bring everybody together and do things as a whole school because they kept telling me we couldn't do it and it was going to be a disaster and the kids would be a nightmare. So you need those quick wins and things like that. I've just written to all Year 11 parents uh, with a signed, uh, with a stamp stress envelope asking them to write their child a letter before they commence their Year 11 exams. And that real powerful sort of, you know, most of these kids have never received a letter in their life. Uh, and so those things are, are small things, uh, but quick wins. I guess part of the job being a head teacher uh, for me, it's about protecting my staff from the big bad wolf. Uh, you can all make your mind up about who that might be. Um, but whether it's the marking fiasco, whether it's the curriculum changes, accountability measures, or Ofsted, really just to make sure that they don't have to deal with that. And I really like, I've shared this with staff, that we can't really do much about that. Or we can have a voice, do things like the Hedge Round Table. But really what we can do is adjust the sales in school to make sure that staff are protected as much as possible. And as a head trying to be a top two percenter, trying to be positive all the time, and trying to like iron out all the mood hoovers and inset terrorists in your staff room, and you know who they are. Okay, um, I heard this quote at uh, a session not so long ago by Stephen Monday, and he's uh, head at Compton Village College um, uh, up there somewhere in Cambridge. Um, and he said about tighten up to become good, loosen up to come outstanding. I think that's a really, really good point about spending my first year getting down to basics, working out what the non-negotiables are, working out about simplicity, uh, uh, simple systems and accountability, but allowing people, a bit like uh, our first speaker talked about, giving them the freedom and trust that you need in order them to become outstanding, because systems are fine, and I think uh, this year, oh really? Wow, okay, um, so we'll go through that, that's boring. Um, Learning from the hairy bikers, uh, making sure we share good practice. Uh, you know, you've might have seen that, that program where everybody turns up with a recipe, pins it on a board, you turn up with your own recipe, but you go away with 30 or 40, and trying to do that by going out to certain schools. Uh, and this is a network diagram, and really, the last thing I was going to say about that is just making sure that you build networks well beyond your school, and just find out what are the best schools out there, and find out what they do. Too often, networks... Yes, okay, I'll leave you with this quote. That sums up, I think, my first year of headship. Well done. Thank you, Jane. Well done. Prizes, prizes. Uh, okay, back to our prizes at the moment. Penny looks the front runner for a bottle of champagne, so if you're not tweeting, uh, Penny's going to grab that one. Uh, I just want to introduce some other prizes. So, Namish at the back, you've got to raise your hand. Namish uh, from Show My Homework is offering a school an entire one-year subscription. Namish, training, full support. So if you want to uh, win that prize, Namish, can you tweet me uh, a question or something that you'd like everyone here to uh, compete for? That would be great. And some other prizes from Teaching Leaders. They're offering a couple of books and a few other things. So I'll introduce that one uh, later on tonight. Stephen. Yeah. James, can I just ask, are you enjoying it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. It's really good to hear. Um, and next up we have, oh, sorry, the other thing, Mood Hoover. I've heard, never heard that before. That's fantastic. And I also wrote down insect terrorist. You mean insect? Insect, yes, yeah, not insect terrorist. That'd be quite bizarre, but quite scary at the same time. Um, do we have Jasmine Cloud here? She's not here tonight. <laughs> That'd be why she's not here. Okay, we'll leap straight on to Alex Atherton then. Alex, are you here? Fantastic. Can we all get tweeting as well, please? Ethel, teach me. Just send out a blank tweet. That'll do. Let's get trending, please. I'll retweet everything so everyone can tune in. <coughs> welcome, Alex. Let's welcome Alex, please, folks. So, please sit down. I'm oh. just saying that for the feed. <laughs> Can we have a round of applause for Ross and Stephen, actually, for bothering to set all this up and to do it at all? I think it's fantastic. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, I, I'm only, I only said that to make sure there was a guaranteed round of applause at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, there's bugger up. Sorry, live. There's no chance of that happening. All right, debut here, uh, debut presentation. I may get the tone a little wrong. It, you, might, you may come across a little provocative, even. Uh, but it's only six minutes. Um, so if I, if I offend you, um, then, uh, then, then so be it. I'm sure you'll wait for me outside. Uh, and I'm probably going to raise a lot more questions than, than answers. Um, it's called Warp and Weft. I've got no presentation. Uh, I've got no great quotes, no great whatever. Uh, I just wanted to say something about what I think matters uh, in education that we don't hear enough about. I think there's a, a risk that as a profession, we've got ourselves into a position where we are eternally obsessed with presenting ourselves, not even just as well as we can, but maybe even better than we are, and not always for the benefit of the students. That's not necessarily criticism, because the things that are more easily or even are quickly judged have become the be-all and end-all. So I think we end up obsessed with ensuring that those kids pass that exam on that day and at that time, which they might not if they did it three hours later, the following day, the following week, and let alone a month's time. And a vast chunk of senior and middle leaders' time is dedicated towards that. And I'll say this, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of all these things. I'm ahead myself. I think we are obsessed with, uh, with uh, ensuring that the school keeps it all together for the day and a half that the inspectors are in school. And I, I think we've become very good at, as a profession at readjusting our sights to the, whether it's the new Ofsted framework, we go from 5A to C, 5 including, best 8, uh, and we run the risk of losing the bigger picture. Now, I've eavesdropped some conversations where I hear people talk about, do you know what, we've set it up now, so 80 kids are going to do the IGCSE and paper 1 of AQA and paper 2 of the new Belgian board or whatever else it is um, that's come in. And it makes me wonder if what we pride ourselves on is our agility to adjust to the latest sites, are we concentrating on what's important? Any head teacher, senior leader, head of department knows that if you don't get the results, your job's in jeopardy. Uh, and I understand that. But I hear too many stories where I get the impression some people in our profession are wholly deluding themselves and others if we think that some of our actions actually represent genuine school improvement. A school might look better if you've dragged a large chunk of kids through repeated attempts at an adult literacy or an adult numeracy course, or if you've managed to force feed a whole year group for a BTEC science, but many of those kids are not better off. And sometimes, perhaps particularly in an 11 to 16 school, uh, and I work in one of those, it feels as though we assume that kids evaporate the minute that they leave the door, that, you know, that they cease to be, that they won't go to college or university or they won't even have lives beyond that. I'm not going to say qualifications, inspection reports don't matter. Of course they do, but we've become obsessed by what can or is shown quickly. And teaching and leading a school or you know, anything to do with a school is far, far more complex than that. And school improvement certainly is. I also think too much attention is given to things, this is going to be a rant, so I'm just going to keep going, um, is given to things that don't necessarily offer very much in terms of going forward. Why does anybody ask Anthony Selden anything about his opinion in the national press? Who cares? What relevance has he got to the state school system? Um, you know, and dare I say it, but even, you know, TED Talks, Sir Ken Robinson, Twitter even, you know, it's part of it feels like sacred cows to me in terms of how it's, how it's used um, around the place. Now, I'm going to leave that provocative comment there without having the time to get into it. But the short talk, the quote, what you can say in 140 characters, feels to me sometimes as though it's more important than the long-term practice. And the things that you can't easily measure or the evidence that you can't collect in a short amount of time, in the long run, it makes a huge difference. You look at the Ofsted framework, there's a lot of things in there Fat chance that any group of four or five inspectors are going to be able to look at all of that in a two-day process, actually gather it together and make some kind of reasonable uh, judgment. I'm not having a go at them. I think they do a good job with a short amount of time. But I often say to individuals and the whole staff where I work that nobody really knows the job that you do. And I'm sure the same is true in your own schools. So much of what matters to me is complex, it takes a long time to build, and it cannot easily be seen in a snapshot, a snapshot uh, what I crudely call the warp and weft. 
You know, schemes of work are not written, they are built. You know, being able to uh, become a great teacher over time, you build those school, uh, skills, you don't suddenly develop them. What students remember from their school life, their favorite teachers, their favorite activities, the trip, the big project, the residential, the sports team, the whole school production, you know, big things that make such a difference towards ethos. The school that will take the student on, even if they know they're not going to help their results, and it's the start of year 11. Uh, and most importantly, the extent to which in the long run schools really do meet the needs of the kids that they've got, whether you can prove that to anybody else. How long have I got? 30 seconds? Ten. Ten. Oh, I'll finish then. Thanks very much. <laughs> I am pleased to say that I managed to convince Alex to get back on Twitter uh, and come to his first Teach Nick tonight. So thank you, Alex, and well done. It's a great presentation. Alex, how, how long have you been ahead for? Uh, seven years. So uh, six more years then, James, OK? And then... And <laughs> this is... This is, this is yes. We'll break you. <laughs> Uh, uh, just following on from Namish's uh, offer, show my homework one year subscription. Uh, what we would like to see in a tweet, if you would like this for your school, is your favourite excuse for missing homework. Is that correct, Namish? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I always think of homework. We, we lose our homework. Uh, we often blame kids for not doing homework. We just make it fun and give excuses. So it'd be nice to know what some of our excuses were. Yeah, so your own excuse when you were at school. Please, we'll be looking for the funniest ones. Okay, next up is... Mr. Caffrey. Mr. Caffrey, uh, three minutes on using technology to support school improvement. So over to you, Mr. Caffrey. This is Alex. No, it's not. I think my... Andy. Andy, yeah. apologies. I think my plan is to spend three minutes watching uh, Prezi's loading. That's the plan. Um, <laughs> what, are you going to start when it's loaded? Or let it load for three minutes? This, this may not load, which goes, I'll just talk. Um, sorry, my name's Andy Caffrey. I work at the Streetly Academy, where I'm an assistant head teacher. Um, and our school really ethos, I suppose, is, is about marginal gains and the aggregation of marginal gains, um, really imposed by a head teacher, Billy Downey. Um, and what we try and do is do lots of things well, uh, and all those small things make a big difference. But that can sometimes be hard to work out what's going on when lots of things are going on. So um, we decided to develop an in-house system, which we call the suite. I'm not going to reset the Wi-Fi which we call the suite, um, to, to manage and monitor that, that. What the suite does for us is, if you like, it's our school improvement plan, it's our um, department monitoring and evaluation, it's our performance management system, it's our um, CPD system, uh, we do our lesson observations in it. So it's one central, if you like, piece of the software, um, which we built in-house, that does all of those things. But the advantage of using that is it's about time saving. If there was a lesson observation this afternoon, uh, and we do our lesson observations on iPads, so we've made it iPad friendly. So if there's a lesson, let's say a lesson drop in this afternoon, someone goes in, sees a bit of a lesson, submits it in, it goes live into the system. It can then update, so a head of department can look at how their department's getting on. If we go over to the school improvement plan, um, it updates the data in there. So it, it becomes live data all the time. And rather than people fumbling around looking for paperwork, um, it just enables to move us forward. It saves us time. Although we, we didn't design it for Ofsted, when Ofsted came in, what did we do about it? We gave them a username and password and said, there's a load of evidence, go on and have a look, see what you think. Um, it took them a while because we kept going to meetings and going, yeah, we've, we've done that, it's on the suite. Um, and yes, we've done that, it's on the suite. But after a while, they got into that and um, ultimately, that went well for us. Um, the last Ofsted, we were just outstanding in all categories. And, and part of the reason for that was, was, was just being able to evidence it through the suite. The suite didn't create the outstanding things. The teachers did. The suite helped us evidence that. Well, why am I talking about it and, and why, why relevant is that to you? Because um, we, we decided to move forward with it and just let other schools use it for free. So we decided we've got this thing and it worked for us. And so we now give it to other schools who want to use it. Um, and we've got about 35 schools around the UK so far that have sort of taken us up on that offer and said, yeah, we'd like to apply with it, we'd like to use it, uh, and that's starting to move forward. So if you are interested in using that as a school, then you can obviously contact me through Twitter, at Mr. Caffrey, send me a direct message and I'll get back in touch with you. Um, and if you want to see it in detail, then if you go and look at my Prezi, there's some amazing screenshots. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
of what that looks like. So it takes you through the various sections of the suite, um, and you can go through that, and you can and see it, the different areas it does. We know there are commercial packages that do some of this, that do CPD and do that. For us, it was about linking it together. And for us, it was about driving that forward and having a system um, that we designed and we built, and we could change, and we could continue to move forward. That ostrich is coming out, so I think it's probably time for me to finish. I've got another 30 seconds. What to do, press refresh on the Prezi. <laughs> Um, so if you are interested in using it, then at the end, just come and have a chat with me. Um, but we generally want to share that with other schools because we think it really worked for us, and we know that other schools, it may work for them as well. Thank you very much. Uh, is H. Fortis 1984 here? You had a fire. Yeah, it's actually hair on fire today. Wow. Good work. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, it is? It is approved. It's a PIU. Oh, okay, fair enough. Sorry. I thought you were talking about a building society then. Um, uh, next up is. <laughs> what do I know? Um, next up is uh, Oliver Quinlan, who's a lecturer from Plymouth University, talking about something without slides. Is that right? I've got some slides. If you have got some slides. Okay. Um, it's not on Prezi, is it? No, it's not. Um, hopefully they will load, although it does say connection problems. Are they online? It says connected. Yeah, they are, yeah. Nice weather at the moment, isn't it? <laughs> Everyone. Shall I? Uh, and there is another SL Teach Me uh, in July. Uh, Belmas, Megan, put your hand up. There you go. Uh, so if you fancy a weekend away in Edinburgh, Stephen and I are doing another double act up in Edinburgh. It's a little down the high club <coughs> in Edinburgh. Uh, so all those, there's a ticket page. I can tweet that out later tonight if you're interested in a little jolly up north. There we go. I've, um, I've fixed the Wi-Fi now for anybody else who's got online slides. But <laughs> we'll see whether that, that will load up. It doesn't seem to, seem to be crunching a bit. OK, um, I I'm, I'm just wanted to really float an idea out to you here. My colleague Peter Yeomans, who's uh, e-thinking on Twitter, you, you may well know, um, was going to come and talk, and he wasn't able to at the moment because he's actually reading procurement bids for this uh, school. He's got nine to read by tomorrow, so I think he's going to be up all night. Um, we've been working with a, a free school in Plymouth called the Plymouth School of Creative Arts and it's sponsored by the local College of Arts, Further Education College. And um, it's a really interesting um, kind of project to work with because um, they're trying to build a school around the ethos of having the arts central to the curriculum and a kind of pedagogy around learning as making. And um, they've asked us to sort of come and, and join them and look at how we could build research into that which is an interesting question, and, and we've had some interesting thoughts, I, I hope, about um, how you could actually build research into a school in terms of school improvement. And um, I'd really just like to float this and kind of see um, what you think of it. Um, a lot of these things don't seem to be working. What I'm just going to do is see if I can find my key slide with the, the diagram on it and see if that one um, will load. Um, yeah, basically, what, what we were looking at is there's, there's a lot of sort of talk as, uh, about teachers as researchers, and um, we've had some talk tonight about teachers doing master's projects and PhDs. I, I found doing a master's when I was teaching in the classroom really um, important, and I found carrying that on as, as I've become a university lecturer really important as well. Um, but also, there's one of the things that this school was really wanting to do as well was think about learners as researchers too. And how could they actually get children to think about research, particularly in a, a school that's going to be based around um, creative arts, which it, some critics of the arts may see as not particularly rigorous. Um, so we really wanted to build in that, that kind of research. It's also a, a free school project. So it's, uh, it's quite an unusual free school, I think, in that it's, it's the only free school that I know of, and I haven't looked at, at all of them, that's kind of based around a, a principle of pedagogy um, rather than a religious affiliation or a particular kind of um, 
group that are trying to put something together, like a community group or something. This is very much based around pedagogy. I'd love to hear examples of, of other ones that I haven't heard of, if, if that's incorrect. But um, it's, it's kind of a, a project that's being floated, and they've got to be able to prove what they're doing and prove the impact and actually um, show that basing something around creativity and kind of openness works. And it struck me when they were talking to me about research. We had meetings with various people talking about doing randomized controlled trials and um, following quite quantitative methods of data collection. You know, let's, we'll do this whole arts thing and then see if they get good exam results at the end. Um, that those kinds of measures don't really fit with the whole ethos of the school, which is about unlocking people's creativity. And um, I did a lot of, of reading and research into, here we go, here's the diagram into um, research methods. And um, one of the things I'd always thought about research was that it had to follow this very specific scientific method, that you had to try and control for everything and um, put one input in and see what comes out at the other end, and that kind of quantitative method. And a lot of the reading I did was, was about um, research that was much more interpretive. Um, when you look at things and just sort of a, an observational perspective, like you might do in, in anthropology, and look at what's actually happening here and see what emerges. Instead of saying, do this and we get that, actually saying, well, let's see what happens and see what kind of emerges. And there's all sorts of interesting methodology um, for that, particularly around um, analyzing really complex sources like interviews or video footage or conversations, and then tagging it based on what emerges, rather than looking at um, trying to prove something, making a hypothesis, actually just exploring it and um, constantly looking at it again and again and tagging it and trying to see what's happening there without sort of imposing your own view on it. And I thought this was quite an interesting idea in terms of the school as a research project. So what we came up with as a, as a possible idea is to actually make this pyramid of research in the school. Now the school at this, um, the bit at the bottom, the school itself in this case is a research project because we want to know what happens when you um, have a school based around creative arts and learning as making. Um, but everyone's kind of involved, rather than it just being an, an outside thing. So it starts off with the children, really, and the idea is that you get the children researching their own learning, uh, making things and seeing what is emerging from, um, from that making. In quite a rigorous way, hopefully, what we want to do is to try and get the children actually using some of these qualitative research techniques to code and tag the things that they are creating to try and define what's the actual learning that's, that's coming out of this when they are making things when they're working on arts projects. And then the next stage is um, the teachers. And I think what's really going to be key to this part is working on what the children have come up with, but also masses of documentation. And I think now that we have technology like tablets, smartphones, things with cameras and stuff, we find we've got the potential to document loads of things that are going on in terms of process, in terms of um, things that have been hard to record for a while in terms of the arts, and kind of tag that and see what's going on there, and then move that up and feed that up to the school level. So what I'm hoping that we could end up with with this model is that research starting off with the children, seeing what emerges in terms of their learning when they're making stuff, seeing what emerges in terms of the teacher's understanding of that learning, and then feeding up to that, that top level kind of research project, which is does a school based around the arts and making as learning have a um, big impact on, uh, on children. So just something I wanted to share as perhaps a slightly unusual idea, and I'd be keen to have your feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Keep, keep that slide up for a moment. Thank you. Uh, just as an observation, I know that there's a lot of talk about flipped classrooms, and I think it's a really nice model. I wonder if there are any schools here who've got the, um, the photograph of the, all the members of staff. I'd love to see one once where the children are at the top and everyone else is supporting. So you've got the children at the top and then the teachers and then the head supporting the staff supporting the children. It's the flipped model of that viewpoint. Um, we're going to take a break now and we're going to try a scientific experiment at the same time. Um, not in the food sense. Um, in theory, with enough people in this room, we should have two people who share the same birthday. So uh, I think the, the minimum number for this is 23 people. So our challenge for break time in the 10 minutes that we have for break to grab some sandwiches and crisps and drinks is to see if we can find a pair who've got the same birthday. So start off by sharing your birthday on your table. And uh, if you don't know anyone, find out their birthday. See if we can do this in 10 minutes. 
Okay. Off you go. Ten past seven, back in the room. Thank you.